Hello, and welcome to the Data Engineering Podcast, the show about modern data management. When you're ready to build your next pipeline or want to test out the projects you hear about on the show, you'll need somewhere to deploy them. So check out Linode. With 200 gigabit private networking, scalable shared block storage, and a 40 gigabit public network, you've got everything you need to run a fast, reliable, and bulletproof data platform. If you need global distribution, they've got that covered too with worldwide data centers, including new ones in Toronto and Mumbai. Go to dataengineeringpodcast.com slash Linode today to get a $20 credit and launch a new server in under a minute. And go to dataengineeringpodcast.com to subscribe to the show, sign up for the mailing list, read the show notes, and get in touch. And don't forget to go to dataengineeringpodcast.com slash chat to join the community and keep the conversation going. Your host is Tobias Macy, and today I'm interviewing Christian Heinzman about how data pipelines evolve as your business grows. So Christian, could you start by introducing yourself? Sure. Christian Heinzman. I'm the uh, Director of Data Engineering on Data Warehousing for uh, Grubhub. I've been there for about uh, two years. Uh, really what I'm been working on is dealing with our ETL pipelines. We have uh, two data warehouses. One is a more traditional, one is our more big data pipeline. So that's uh, what I do day to day. I've l- learned a lot of things along the way, made some right decisions, made some wrong decisions. All right. And do you remember how you first got involved in the area of data management? Yeah. So when I, this was, I started my career as a more of a traditional software engineer, but a lot of my work was heavy, heavy data processing. So there's a lot of scraping of websites, cleaning up that data, storing it. And as I was going through that, I sort of got very interested in business, just how, what does the business need? Sort of pivoted my career toward a little bit more towards startups. And in the startup world, I uh, started building more of our analytical data warehouses, which let me interface with all the areas of the business, which was something that I was interested in. Got really interested in business and data warehousing uh, and the how you deal with all this data and started moving up to, uh, I guess, through the startup world, ended up going to, to Grubhub, where we actually have uh, large amounts of interesting data problems. That's where I am. And speaking of interesting problems, the fact that you have two different data warehouses for, I'm assuming, slightly different purposes, uh, I'm sure poses some unique challenges as far as how you're processing the data and making sure that everything stays in sync. So I'm wondering if you can just briefly talk about the sort of main use cases that each storage location serves in terms of the broader business needs. They're trying to serve uh, very similar use cases. Uh, in some ways, it's really, we're trying to, how do we do this data warehousing at the scale that we are? Uh, there's so, when we do our more traditional data warehouses in, in Redshift, which is really good for fast ad hoc queries, as long as the, the server is not under too much load, it's great for that. Uh, but what it's really had challenges on was scaling the right part uh, in the loading part. Uh, so that was really what was started the move to a more of a, a big data stack. So our big data stack is a lot of our ETL is done with high uh, Spark and Hive on top of Amazon, Amazon EMR. We can spin clusters up and down, which basically gives us almost uh, infinite amounts of compute power, which really helps our write scale. And then that's, that's probably a big difference of having that and that data warehouse. Uh, really helping with our write scale. And there's yeah, there's definitely challenges keeping them in sync. Sometimes we try to sync from one to the other. Sometimes we, we don't. It's a uh, work in progress, it sounds like. Yep. Yeah, it's definitely one of these. Uh, I think this is one of some of the challenges came from what I was talking about scaling ETL is that we weren't able to scale uh, with our Redshift. Uh, how do we... Uh, there was a lot of other choices had we done. Uh, probably would have been a made this tra- transition a little bit easier. And so given your experience at startups and now moving to Grubhub and trying to scale the capabilities for data processing there, you ended up writing an interesting blog piece that inspired me to reach out to you and talk a bit more about your experiences of building ETL and data processing pipelines for some of these different scales of organization and data volumes. So I'm wondering if you can just start by sharing what your definition is for how you think about a data pipeline. Uh, sure. So when I say data pipeline, I actually have a very probably simplistic de- definition. Uh, I would say anytime you're going to move or transform data from one place to another, uh, that's your data pipeline. 
Uh, it could be something very simple. Uh, you can just have something like a cron job that does a SQL query, and that's your data pipeline. Uh, it could be as complex as having a dedicated scheduler pulling data from uh, streams and from multiple data sources to combine them together that ends up having multiple steps in your transformation jobs. But I would call all those data pipelines. I, I think a lot of people may end up thinking of data pipeline as the latter, but I definitely really just say it's anytime you're moving data, you're building a data pipeline. And so given that very broad definition, anytime that you need to deal with data at all, you can start thinking about that in terms of pipelining operations. And so uh, in the beginning of the post that you wrote, you were describing that when you're first building an application or starting to try and build out an organization, that your pipeline should be very simplistic and mostly manual. So I'm wondering if you can just discuss some of the approaches that you take at the early stages of a business and small scale data and some of the design characteristics that you should be targeting for that type of pipeline. Yeah, I mean, the in a word, the simple, try to make it as simple as possible. At that stage, a lot of times you don't quite know even if you have a product market fit. Uh, so all of your engineering resources or most of your engineering resources should be gone into actually figuring out product market fit, uh, whether that's tweaking the products or figuring out who to talk to. That's where a lot of the, your time should be spent and less time actually building up any sort of scalable pipeline. And so besides just the engineering side of that, but not spending engineering time on it. Uh, in order for, especially like a starting of a project, if you're following more of a lean or agile methodology, that wherever you're pulling the data from is going to change a lot. So if you have something simple and, and lean that you can actually help, that it can change quickly, uh, is probably the better way to go. Really, and I wouldn't even be looking at any sort of complex metrics at that point either. Uh, so anything that, we'd look at some really like high level metrics, something like, how many customers did you have? I wouldn't maybe not even worry about conversion rates. Uh, revenue, I'd probably get. And this could be all stuff that you can pull probably right from whatever production or transactional system you have. So at, at, that, at that stage, you wouldn't even need a dedicated like, data warehouse. You're, that scale that you're having, there is, I'm sure there is some time in the day your database is free enough that you can issue a, a couple SQL statements to get some data out of it. That's so simple in a word. Yeah. And as you're saying, just being able to run a few SQL statements and dump it out to some CSVs and yep. just do your processing in Excel or whatever spreadsheet program you use should be sufficient. And that has the added benefit, too, of saving the engineering resources that you could be spent building the product, but also not bogging down anyone else in the business who is trying to gain some insights from that data in terms of having to train them up on using whatever tool you're leveraging to be able to create the reports because pretty much everyone knows how to use a spreadsheet. They can do their own analyses. Uh, at this stage, there isn't really enough complexity or enough different transition points that you have to worry too much about having sort of like a golden master of the data where you're worrying about different people getting different insights from the same resources because you're all probably going to be in the same room and can just sort of talk over it. Right. Yeah. And, and you, you don't even have to worry about the uh, breaking any limits of Excel or Google Sheets. They, you won't have that much data. <laughs> and so as you start to build out the applications or build out the business and gain more customers or more data, what are some of the indicators that you look for to be able to signal that you're starting to reach that next order of magnitude in terms of scale of complexity, scale of data, scale mm -hmm. of the organization where you need to redesign the requirements for your data pipeline mm -hmm. and some of your considerations of how you would approach that re-architecture? Uh, yeah, that's a, it's a good question. I, I think it's something that probably, it's going to be hard to, to see if you're not looking for it, but there's definitely, like we talked a little bit about like product market fit, as you're starting to gain some traction, this is definitely going to be a time where you should start paying a little bit more attention to, all right, we're gaining some traction, we have some users, we have some idea of how the business runs, at least today. Uh, you'll start getting more insights into either what your product's doing, how people are interfacing with your products, how if you're doing any sort of things with uh, logistics, how your systems are operating. You'll start be people will be able to ask more sophisticated questions of things. They'll start trying to want to optimize a little bit more. Uh, they'll see inefficiencies. 
And that's really the time where it's really good to start actually laying down a little bit more of a dedicated analytical system. You'll also start seeing uh, different access patterns of your data. If you had some sort of very simple pipeline, people are going to start asking for a little, your SQL queries are going to get a little bit more complex, start being a little bit more sophisticated. It's, these are all signs that all right, maybe we should be building a more dedicated analytical system, uh, particularly since those queries that people will be building will be more than likely ag more aggregate in nature, and the, your production data warehouses will more likely be transactional in nature. So having them separate for separate use cases around that time starts to make sense. And as you're starting to approach that medium scale, even if you don't have a dedicated data warehouse in place yet, one potential beneficial next step beyond the spreadsheet approach is to start employing some sort of business intelligence tool, whether it's something like Metabase or Redash or Looker, so that everyone has one view of the data. They're all using the same queries instead of everybody crafting their own aggregates. Uh, so that way you at least have some commonality in terms of the information that people are seeing and it can store some of those computed aggregates within that business intelligence platform before you get to the full scale of having a uh, data warehouse or a data lake. Yeah, and, and actually you touched on something that's very dear to me is I, I'm a very, uh, actually I think I listened to your, uh, I listened to one of the episodes of your podcast, uh, I forget by who we were talking about curating data. Uh, and that's actually one of the things that's very dear to me as well. Uh, I think that's sort of like that stepping start, stepping points uh, with these, these common queries and access patterns, you start knowing what to start looking at to curate. So as you start to reach a more medium scale in terms of the organization and the data volumes that you're working with, what have you found to be some of the complexities and challenges that begin to present themselves as you start to build a more production grade data pipeline and run these jobs on a more frequent basis? Yeah, yeah. So there's there's definitely challenges. I mean, from a any sort of data pipeline is going to have some amount of brittleness. It's, it's hard to use the word brittleness, but there's definitely as data is moving, there's a lot of potential for change. And once you're at this sort of medium scale, uh, you probably don't want to take the time to decouple everything completely, which means you have things a little bit more tightly integrated. Some of the changes in one system may cascade into bigger failures. And then just in terms of build, what is the right amount of things that you should be putting inside the data warehouse? I've definitely seen cases uh, just or organizationally, people get very excited about, okay, we're finally, we're, we're going to have a, more of an analytical data warehouse. Uh, they want everything in there. Uh, but that's, it takes time to get everything in there. Uh, and uh, they may not actually look at all of it. So really, it's in some ways taking some of the learnings from the the earlier forms of the queries and dashboards, sp spending a lot of time on the real important pieces of data that people are looking at. And then also as you're building it out, uh, you're going to have your issues with, I mean, now it's a production system. Uh, let's make sure, and this is something I've seen people skip or not quite go as deep. Like this is an easy part to miss some of the uh, monitoring of your pipelines uh, tends to be something that falls off sometimes. It's one of those, it's working, people are analyzing the data, quite realize that it's actually a production grade system. <laughs> At some point, it it's a it's an interesting transition once it goes from a, okay, we're just hacking together, not hacking, but we're, we're just pulling together uh, SQL scripts and it's important, but not a production system to, oh, right, this is actually turning into a production system. Uh, we, we should actually have production type controls on it. Yeah, and I think one sort of good uh, metric to measure how much of a production system it is is how often people complain when things stop working. Right. Because at the <laughs> early stages, it'll be, oh, it's broken, nobody noticed, okay, this is fine. But as more people start to realize that there is this system in place, that it is valuable, that they can gain some useful information from it, then they'll be more likely to let you know when things stop working. And then right. you start to realize, oh, wait, I need to put some more quality controls and uh, metrics and alerting in place to make sure that this stays running when I'm not looking at it actively. And I mean, in some ways, you're actually your fixes end up being a little bit harder to deploy as well. So before, if you have just SQL script, oh, it didn't work. Let me tweak my SQL script and just put it back onto the server. Once you have a get a little bit more of a dedicated system, there's usually a little bit more of a 
more robust release process, uh, which may take a little bit longer. You probably have multiple, a lot more people looking at the, the code. Uh, so there's definitely PRs, uh, re- reviews, and that sort of thing. So And another problem that can start to make itself known even at the medium scale, but particularly going into as you get to a larger scale and more complicated analyses is trying to minimize the impacts on the source systems that you're pulling the data from to be able to populate these data lakes and data warehouses. So I'm wondering if you have found any particular strategies that are useful for trying to prevent any sort of production impact on the applications that are using those data sources as you're building these aggregates and uh, doing these extractions? Uh, Yeah, no, it's actually a very, it it can be a big problem. When when you're going to try to pull uh, especially uh, some of these queries can be quite intensive. You, you don't want to take down your production system or even slow it down. We say there's a different, it sort of depends on, in some ways it depends on your your stack for your production system. I can backtrack a little bit. I would say uh, one thing that I find is very important, this is kind of going back to my software engineering background and thinking about things in terms of who has what responsibility and how do you, can you appropriately uh, decouple things. I would say if you could start putting in any sort of more well-defined interface between your production system and your analytical system, uh, this could either be putting some well-defined data onto a shared storage, or it could be some sort of sh- streaming platform or any sort of uh, like sort of pub sub architecture that a analytical system can plug into uh, this well-defined interface between the two systems you can kind of put that, if you put that in early, uh, that's going to help out with not impacting the production system uh, because that's usually they just have a very small amount of work to do if, and just push once and then it's done. Uh, and then when you're reading it, you don't impact production at all. But that's that said, there's also um, other kind of strategies you can have. So if you have, depending on your the type of production system, transactional system you have, if it's more of a relational database, uh, something that works really well is just using the capabilities of having a replication node and just your analytics point to the replication node. That works really well, but probably the, uh, and as you get a little bit more, if it's not relational, I get a little bit more into like the NoSQL land. We've pulled stuff in from different backups and other things that aren't actually talking to the production system. It's another process of the production system pushing data somewhere. So it, it knows its access patterns better. But I'd repeat about the if you have some sort of streaming system that helps a lot. Yeah, and I like your point too about having a defined interface for being able to pull the data from because that can help reduce some of the brittleness in sourcing the data because if you have maybe a defined API particularly if it's well-versioned, then you can predictably have the same shape of data and same structure of data each time you're running these jobs rather than having to worry about any underlying database migrations that might occur as part of the application lifecycle and then having that break your data loads and transformations because there's either an extra column you didn't account for or a column's been renamed or a data type has been changed. But having that API, you're more likely to maintain consistency and you're more likely to have a discussion, particularly as you start to break up your teams between software engineering and data engineering of having that established interface to couple those two systems and those two organizational teams. Yep, completely. And uh, as you mentioned, streaming systems, another approach would be to use something like change data capture, which reintroduces some of the potential for brittleness as the structure of the database changes, but helps to reduce the overall impact on the source systems because you're not using up computational resources at a web layer via using some sort of API, but it, it increases the complexity and the challenge on the data engineering team to be able to reconstruct the data from those uh, change data records. Yep, yep, yep. And so uh, as you, again, start to 
go beyond that medium scale and into another order of magnitude into so-called large scale and big data systems and start to integrate multiple data sources together beyond just what your applications are producing. I'm wondering again, if you have any sort of indicators that signal that you are starting to reach that next order of magnitude and some of the ways that you start to consider redesigning your data pipelines and some of the approaches that you would take to be able to build more high level and complex uh, aggregations and metrics and analyses on top of those different data sources? In some ways, it's going to look similar to when you went from small, small to medium. You're going to start, some of your parts of your system will get more stressed. Also, you'll have, you wouldn't necessarily have similar queries, but you'll have people asking for the same metrics over and over again. I would say that that's one big indicator that your product or organization is becoming mature. If you've done some of the medium scale place, I think coming to large scale becomes a lot easier. But if you haven't, there will definitely be some, you'll hit some limits in terms of processing. You won't be able to keep up with the volumes of data. Your data increases by millions or billions of records a day. These are all sorts of things that indicate you probably want a little bit more of a large scale system. In some ways, even just having the number of different sources you want to integrate with is also sort of an indicator. As organizations grow, I found the tools aren't necessarily standardized cross teams. Uh, if you have your sales team could be broken up into different sorts of sales and they may be using different sorts of CRM systems. Your marketing team may be doing different sorts of marketing. You may, they may be tracking those forms of marketing in different systems. Your operations team may be looking to interface with uh, some other tool that lets them really understand how the business is operating. Uh, and I think once you start realizing be having all just these number of things, uh, that's another sort of indication that you're getting into more of a larger scale. And so particularly when you reach the large scale of data and organization, but even potentially at medium to small scale, there's been a much bigger focus on using data lakes in place of data warehouses or in supplement to them. So I'm wondering what your thoughts are on that overall approach and how you see data lakes fitting into the overall analytical infrastructure for a given organization. I, I really like data lakes, particularly when used uh, appropriately. I think when oh, I was first hearing the concept of data lakes and uh, some of my peers first heard the concepts, there was half, some, some were really excited. They didn't have to do any work anymore. They just could dump everything in data lake and they're done. Others were afraid of, well, if everything, all the data is there, how are people going to analyze it? And I think both those fears are sort of valid. Uh, so I think you need to have a, having a data lake really helps kind of decouple inside your data pipeline. The data lake can kind of be a, a staging area for a lot of different data. Uh, it lets you have this persistent storage sort of in the middle of what I would call it a full ETL pipeline. So if your your system or whatever you're using, you're using a query and the query breaks for some sort of curated data. You, don't, you probably don't have to go all the way back into the transactional system. Uh, the data is captured already on the data lake. Uh, so it kind of lets this, you can debug and develop solely in an analytical kind of environment. But I think the data lake has to be managed. Uh, it can't just be a dumping ground of things. You still need to make sure you have organization in there. You have to make sure you have uh, access patterns. It, it, it's it's an important. I think it's an important piece, and it helps a lot with scale. As long as it's not treated as like a dumping ground, it, it works really well. Yeah, you don't want it to turn into a swamp. C correct. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, as you mentioned, a lot of times they're used as sort of a staging ground for the data after it's been extracted from the transactional systems or from third-party data sources. And the transformations can then be performed off of that staging ground. So that can help minimize some of the potential loss of fidelity or loss of information from either bad transformations or ill-considered transformations. So wondering if you can talk a bit about some of your approaches on that front to try and reduce the impact of transformations on the uh, quality and efficacy of the data that you're processing. Yeah, uh, there's definitely one thing that's sort of nice having a, a data lake. It kind of is a safety net in some ways. Uh, it kind of, you're not going to lose anything, especially if you're going to do sort of uh, other transformations, uh, you can actually, when so, sometimes actually some of the transformations you'll intentionally 
want to discard certain amounts of information. Respect maybe you have uh, outliers that you want to clean up for certain workloads, or you want to. Uh, there's some form of records that you know are usually some sort of test pattern, or maybe it's somebody doing something weird with your transactional system, and this isn't the table that is going to care about that person doing something weird. It really wants like how actual real users are using the system. Uh, so you can, you'll actually kind of throw those records away. But when people are using that, sometimes questions can come up and the, you can actually always go back to the uh, more raw source data in your data lake, analyze that, say, okay, this is why we've discarded these records. And now maybe we need to tweak how our logic is. And then you can always run a backfill uh, on the downstream ETL, whatever that table was. Uh, so you can clean that up. I mean, uh, other ways, there's definitely uh, having uh, validation works, uh, validation frameworks uh, when you're doing ETL and transformations also helps. Uh, that's another thing I need balances and trade-offs on. I've seen some validation checks be a little too aggressive. Sometimes something weird is actually something normal. Uh, and if you do too aggressive, then you'll start failing when things shouldn't actually be failing, uh, but too loose, and then you're going to have your, your bad data. So I'd say validation frameworks are important, just have to be used uh, appropriately as well. Uh, but again, back to the, it's nice having that safety note of knowing our, my source data is there. I didn't lose anything. I'm not going to take down production because I have a data lake on some big storage. And in terms of the actual workflow engine and the, uh, the tools that you're using for performing these different stages of the pipeline, I'm wondering what you have found to be useful selection criteria in terms of the technology that's being used and the way that it fits into the organization and the team that's leveraging it. Yeah, I'd say when when researching sort of like the technologies and the engines that we'll use, uh, I really want a balance of like ease of use, uh, kind of the features uh, and how flexible it is. I really want to make sure that it's something that fits inside of the environment. So like uh, at, at Grubhub, uh, we have certain tools that we've standardized on. Uh, and so whatever we pick should be able to incorporate with Jenkins. Uh, our data team is a Python shop. It should be able to, people should be able to interact with it in, in Python. So being able to make sure it, it fits within the skill set of the organization and the tooling of the organization is probably one of the more important things I would look at. But then other features I would look at, things that are nice for me when I'm looking at it, uh, things like uh, dependency management, anything that kind of helps Managing dependencies in jobs, uh, jobs can end up being, the dependency chain could be quite complicated. So having a, a tool with that is really nice. Uh, having a tool that lets me kind of debug stages in the pipeline are nice. So you have some UI, let me show where things failed. Uh, hopefully we can start and stop different steps in jobs is really nice. And making sure that it's not too hard for developers to get up and running with it. Uh, make sure it's something that people will, will find value add. And so what are the tools that you're using now and have used previously that you have been most satisfied with? Uh, yeah, so uh, right, right now we're using uh, Azkaban. Uh, it's, it has some really nice things. Uh, it lets us, the UI is pretty nice. Uh, lets us deploy things out pretty easily. We've built out some custom things on top of it. It lets us uh, incorporate a like, continuous build integration into it. So in, in the past, other tools that I've used, I've used uh, Luigi in the past as well. Uh, Luigi had uh, similar similar things. I don't remember being able to quite as easily start and stop different stages in the job, but that was, it was, I really liked its visualization layer. And I found I was able to write more customized with Luigi. Those are probably the two, two big ones that I've used. And I mean, I've used CronTab in the past too, but that's there's not much nice about that. <laughs> I, I don't really have anything to say on that front. It, it's great when it works. Yeah. Often it doesn't. <laughs> and in terms of your preference of build versus buy for the tools that you're using, both for the workflow engine and the different storage and processing layers, how has that changed over the course of your career and at different scales of organization and business needs and concerns? I would say all right, my, my opinion on build versus buy is that whatever is critical to your business, whatever is that your core business, you should always build. Nobody's going to know the business as well as you do. Uh, anything that's sort of ancillary to that, uh, you should buy. And I don't think that stance really changes in terms of different scale. 
but what becomes critical to your business can change at scale. Oh, I would definitely say any sort of logic when you're pulling data in from source systems. So you have, even your, the source systems have had some criticality inside your, your organization or your business. And those have usually been customized. So if it's something like a, if you're support heavy and some of you're using something like a Zendesk to really manage uh, some, some sort of ticket flows and you have custom things built inside of there, well, you might want to build the the, ape, the uh, extraction from Zendesk into your data warehouse just because you might need to know what some of these custom data points mean. But something like a workflow scheduler that doesn't really affect the business or uh, something like a uh, it, it, even just cluster management of ter- in terms of oh, so we use e- EMR at GrowPub, so we have cluster management like that can be it's not necessarily a core, so we can we can buy whatever we can buy with that. And the definition of buy in this context has even become fuzzy with the proliferation of different open source tools and frameworks. So I'm wondering what your thoughts are on uh, what qualifies as <laughs> buying versus building these days, because that line is getting pretty blurry. Uh, it yeah, it is. I mean, it's sometimes open source is great, especially in the big data world. I mean, they have a, a lot of tools that are kind of necessary to get built. But I would say sometimes it doesn't necessarily have all the polish of what you would if you buy something. So it really depends on how critical is this to your business and where are the failing points. Uh, a probably good a- example would be something like, a, I think you mentioned Redash earlier. It's like an op- open source, which is really good for getting it up, up and running. You, know, you, people, you can give people access to the data using Redash without putting too much effort into any sort of sales cycle or any sort of evaluation periods, but it's missing a lot of features that a lot of business users and myself uh, would actually like. So sometimes buying may be beneficial there. And it it doesn't have to be a, a one or nothing solution either. You can mix and match. And in your current role in particular, but also in your past experiences, what are some of the types of dead ends or edge cases that you've had to deal with in terms of building and managing and growing these different data pipelines? It, so I'd say one sort of mistake that I've I've seen is people can, even inside of, where I talked a couple of times about how you can decouple your, your data pipeline and you have your transactional system, your data lake, your curated data assets, uh, people can end up being siloed into those, uh, not necessarily thinking about the data pipeline as a whole. Uh, so you would, it's very, and it, it's natural. Uh, so you have a transactional system, this software engineer working on the transactional system. If you don't have any sort of well-defined interface between that transactional system and the analytics system, it's very easy for the software engineer just to not think about the analytical system because it's not something that's uh, he's, he's need to. Uh, and similarly on the analytical side, it's very easy to uh, say like, well, I'm building data into the data lake. Uh, and that's all I really need to look at with that. And then forgetting, oh, oh well, actually, people are going to need to pull data out of this for different use cases. And then even when you're building sort of curated assets, it's, it's known to be, why are you building it? Sometimes it can be easy to overlook. And my view on things is the most, in, the, the, most the, the reason that we're building this at all is one of one of the most pressing use cases is really to make sure that you can analyze your business, track your business. Uh, you can start getting value add into the business too. Once you start talking about uh, different data science models, being able to do like feedback loops into the transactional system, uh, but making sure that people sort of understand that at every stage you're building towards a holistic pipeline. Uh, if you lose sight of that, uh, sometimes things can be, uh, it, it can You'll do duplicate work or extra work or things can be brittle or break. So I would say that that's that's one thing I'd be wary about. And what have you found to be some of the common edge cases that you have run up against or overlooked aspects of building these data pipelines? So I'd say some sort of edge cases just in terms of scale. I can just sort of give some things that have happened. This wasn't directly on my team and I forget some of the specifics, but there was definitely an ETL process that happened. Uh, we were, how it was processing things, we ended up failing uh, because we hit the max int number. So that was definitely something we didn't account for. But then we have other sort of edge cases in terms of business. We have, I think I was talking about some of like the validation frameworks before, particularly in the grow up business. Thanksgiving 
our, our volume drops off quite a bit. Uh, we haven't had in the past with all sorts of validation warning bells going off, and it was normal, like because people just were eating dinner at home. And the other, I wouldn't say this is necessarily an edge case, particularly at Grubhub. This is just a an airing of my grievance on time zones in general. I'm not a fan. <laughs> uh, it, it, you it, you it take it everywhere. everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's particularly for analytical use cases. I mean, it's easy to store. UTC, but uh, we, we deal with times everywhere. We deal, when does your job kick off? Uh, if you have a time-based like scheduler, uh, when does it hit kick off? That changes mid-year twice. But then if you're storing everything in UTC, not everybody is going to want to look at it in UTC and how do you make sure that you're exposing the right times to the right person. So that's, that's a time zones are not a fan. Yeah. Yeah. There's a great list of falsehoods that programmers believe about time, most of which are contradictory <laughs> to, 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 to the other items in the list. So I'll, I'll add that to the show notes because it's always good for a laugh and a groan. And what are some of the plans that you have going forward for improving the pipeline that you're building at Grubhub and trying to bring it to the next level of scale and resiliency? Yeah. I mean, so I mean, some of the things we, we've touched on, well, we talked a little bit how we have our, our two data warehouses. We're going to start leveraging streaming e- even more. Uh, we have some streams in place, but uh, it's been a a point where we really need to use them more in order to efficiently scale. So that's a definitely a hot item that we're going to do. Uh, the second piece is less on the pipeline in general, but it's more on metadata about our pipeline. It's another thing that we've seen is as all these transformations are happening and data is moving, it gets really hard to know if I'm looking at this particular column in this particular row, how did that data get there? What does it actually mean? Uh, what could have gone wrong along the way? So really putting in more more pieces around or around that. So how do we data linear, either data lineage or data uh, dictionaries like that? That's another piece that we're we're big at using or going to be improving at our pipelines. And are there any particular references or resources that you have found particularly useful over your career and or anything that you recommend people look at for anyone who's looking to build and design a new data platform or new data pipelines? Oh, yeah. I mean, I would, so I would, and first I would plug my, my blog entry on bytes.growhub.com just for some, it's, it's high level, gives you some broad ideas as to where to go, but it's a good sort of to get in the right mindset. Uh, personally, Airbnb has some great articles that I've looked at. I've had some really good success participating in uh, just local data user groups, uh, talking with people about uh, what they use. There's, I could probably dig up some more references uh, after this that we could probably plug in, put in the, the show notes, blanking on any particular any particular article that I would recommend. But uh, if I, uh, I can try to go look look for some and then. Maybe we could post them. Yeah, we'll definitely include those in the show notes. And are there any other aspects of building data pipelines and scaling organizations and applications and technology stacks that we didn't cover yet, which you think we should discuss before we close out the show? I think that was the most of the parts we said we were going to talk through. And so for anybody who wants to get in touch with you and follow the work that you're up to, I'll have you add your preferred contact information to the show notes. And as a final question, I'd like to get your perspective on what you see as being the biggest gap in the tooling or technology that's available for data management today. And I, and I think this will go back to the uh, one of the improvements that we want to do is particularly when you're talking through like open source tools, big data tools, really having something that can kind of help a tool that kind of helps holistically tie data lineage together has been really tough to find. There's definitely some out there, but they don't incorporate with everything or they're really hard to to integrate into everything. I would say that's probably one big piece that I'd be looking for. It's kind of, we, we have all these great tools on how to measure our business, but how to measure the, the measurement. Uh, I've been having trouble finding really great tools with that. All right. Well, thank you very much for taking the time today to join me and discuss your experiences of building and scaling data pipelines and organizations. Uh, It's been fun. It's been a useful conversation for me, and uh, I appreciate that, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Oh, you too. This was great. I had a lot of fun. Thank you. (laughs) 